Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture, Getting Started with Your MBA Application. Uh, this is the first uh, lecture in a series of lectures that will help you prepare a strong MBA application and get you admitted in your dream school. Our speaker and lecturer today is Dr. Don Martin, who is the founder of Grad School Roadmap. Don, I'm giving the word to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nelly, and uh, hello everyone. It is so great to be back with the uh, Unimi Prep uh, and Access MBA and the Advent Group, uh, my colleagues that I have in so enjoyed working with over the years. This is an incredible opportunity. They have given me many times to speak with prospective MBA or graduate school students over the years, and I'm delighted to participate in this lecture series. Thank you so much. At whatever point you will be watching this, I am so appreciative that you took the time to do so. And I hope that when you leave this time together with me, you will feel that it was worth the time you spent sharing this uh, few moments uh, of your day with me. Now, as you can see on this screen, I'm not going to read these out loud, but this is just a little bit of information for you to help you understand why it might be that I am actually doing this lecture today. In particular, those of you who are thinking about an MBA, you might be interested to know that during the 28 years that I spent as an admissions dean at the four institutions that you see there, 11 of those years, just under half of that time, was spent at the Chicago Booth School of Business as dean of admissions and eventually associate dean for the full-time MBA program. During that 11 years, it was my privilege and sometimes a major challenge to evaluate over 80,000 full-time MBA applications. And added to Columbia, Northwestern, and Wheaton, over that 28-year period, I evaluated over 125,000 applications. I don't say this to brag in any way, but rather to let you know that I have been on this side of the table as an evaluator of applications for quite a large space of time in my career. And secondly, in addition to that, I have earned myself a master's degree and a PhD. So I've sat where you are as a prospective graduate student twice. And while not everyone needs to pursue a graduate degree, this is not a requirement for overall success in life, I do believe it can help many times. And I want you to know, if you're thinking of doing this, you can do it. Some folks are very afraid, understandably so. If you're going to be relocating to another part of the world, you have that to think about. You may have financial constraints. You may have other things that cause you to be a little bit apprehensive, a little bit nervous about this. Well, I can just say, join the club. That's very normal. There's nothing wrong with that. And while I don't have time to go into my personal story with you, if you knew more about my personal story, you would know that if I can do this, anybody can. <laughs> so I just want to encourage you at the start of this presentation, you can do this. Uh, it might not be always easy. It might not always be with everything falling right into place, but you can do it. Uh, later in the broadcast, by the way, or later in the lecture, I will be sharing with you some contact information since I won't be able to take questions today at this time. I certainly would be happy to entertain any questions you would like to ask me. I'll provide my contact information for that purpose toward the end of the presentation, as well as providing you some information about my book in case that would be of interest. So what are we going to talk about in these few minutes together? And by the way, it will be a few minutes. I do not believe in dragging things out. I will not be going on and on and on. I expect that my presentation should be over in about 30 to 35 minutes. So this is not a long, drawn-out presentation. What I'm going to cover today briefly is a bit of information about Grad School Roadmap, the company that I founded in 2008. This is my 16th year now with Grad School Roadmap. It's been an incredible journey. Then I want to focus on what I consider to be the most important part of my entire presentation, my entire lecture. And that is 
the biggest mistake prospective MBA or prospective graduate students make. This happens every year. It happens in every country around the globe. And Nellie has been so patient to be with me for so many of these presentations. If I turn the mic over to her, she could take this and completely present it. She knows it so well because it's part of almost every presentation I make. But it's so important that it is in every presentation. We'll talk about that. Then we'll talk about why is it important to plan ahead and take the time to do some planning before you submit your applications. Why is that important? We'll talk about that. Then I'm going to spend a little time making some suggestions about what I call a 12-month application checklist. Now, some of you listening to this lecture today, you may be getting ready to apply this fall to start your MBA or graduate school experience in the fall of 2024. That's okay. You can condense some of these things, but should you be further out, should you be thinking about applying for the fall of 2025, 2026, this could be particularly helpful for anyone in, in whatever year you're thinking about. Then I'm going to spend a few minutes sharing with you, as I said, about my book, about the coaching work we do. Then I'll provide my contact information and we'll be all done. So with that, let's jump in. What is Grad School Roadmap? Well, very briefly, we're a boutique admissions, a graduate admissions resource for, as you can see here, prospective students, applicants, alumni, enrollment management staff. We have a, a team, a very small team uh, that does this work, but we are exclusively former graduate admissions deans and directors. Why do I believe that's important? Because we've actually, as the saying goes, been there and done that. We're speaking with prospective students, with applicants, from a vantage point of having been application evaluators for many years. I think between all of us, you could say we probably have over 60 years of admissions dean experience, and I believe that can be very helpful. As you can see here, we've worked individually with quite a few prospective graduate students over the years, over 850 now, and we've been very fortunate. 97% of them have been admitted to one or more of their top choices, MBA programs and other graduate programs. So just a little bit about us. Now, to the most important part of my presentation, if you don't take anything else away from this lecture today, I hope you will take this. And that is, as a prospective MBA student, graduate student, what is the biggest mistake that you can make? Well, it's very simple. The biggest mistake you can make is not doing adequate reprogram research before you apply. Many students, in my experience over the years, make their choice of where they're going to apply for an MBA program or a graduate school program based on two things only, rankings and word of mouth. Now, am I suggesting that those may not be useful? No, I'm not saying that. They, you can use those, but they should be two of many, many criteria that you are going to use before you narrow it down to the programs to which you will apply. When you limit yourself to what somebody else has to say about a program, or worse yet, a ranking, don't get me started on rankings because they are largely so misleading, so unhelpful, and absolutely have nothing to do with ultimate success in your career. Nothing whatsoever. I'll just say this now. In the 43 years I've been working in higher ed, I started in 1980. Can you believe that? <laughs> Most of you and probably your parents weren't even thought about at that point. But at any rate, that's when I started. And in that time, I have yet to see any valid, reliable evidence that would suggest that your success in your career ultimately is tied to the ranking of the school you attended. There is no proof of that at all. None. What? Zero. Zero. So please, what I'm now going to share with you is how can you plan ahead? How can you do your research? What can you do to help yourself? Well, let's start. You want to avoid the mistake of not doing your research, first of all, 
by spreading the net wide. What do I mean by that? Well, you should not start out with five programs, MBA programs or grad pro. You should start out with 20 or 30 at least. And you, as I'll see, and you should put them on a spreadsheet, create a spreadsheet and list them, in my opinion, in alphabetical order. There should be no ranking at this point. Now, are you going to apply to all of these 20 or 30 programs? Absolutely not. But you're going to do some comparing of programs in a much more methodical and helpful manner than you might have thought should you do this before you heard me give this lecture today. And just in case you're wondering, well, what would I compare? Take a look. Take a, And this is not an exhaustive list. What? Of this list, do you need to put all of these on your spreadsheet? Of course not. But I would think several of them would be very important to you. Very important. Take a look, for instance, at the second column in from the left that starts with academic strength. And I want you to, to scroll down to toward the bottom where it says interaction with current students or alumni. I cannot, I cannot, it still doesn't, it, it baffles me how few prospective students even take the time to speak with current students or recent graduates about their experience with that program. Not about what they think about the ranking of the program. I'm talking about what was it like when you should reach out to at least one current or recently a recent student at one of these programs. And you want to ask them at least two questions. First, what do or did you like most about this program? And second, even more important than the first question, if you had it to do over again, knowing what you now know about this school, about this program, about the faculty, about the curriculum, whatever, would you still enroll? Or would you go somewhere else? Very, very telling questions, extremely telling. Those of my clients who've done this often have dropped a program completely from their list that they thought they'd be applying to before they started doing this research. And look at this. This is just one bullet point of about 50 bullet points on this page. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is what you need to do. I'm telling you. It will it'll alter your list, I'm sure, but it will probably end up helping you truly select those programs that are best for who? For you, not your partner, not your faculty member, not your parents, not your employer. I'm not saying you don't listen to them at all, but that they're not going to this program. You are. This is about you and you alone. And having attended two graduate programs that truly truly just changed my life. They were phenomenal experiences. Do I want to do a third? No, thank you. <laughs> As we say again, been there, done that. But I would do each of them again, given the chance. Each of them, if I had my life over again, those two experiences would be part of what I would repeat, hands down, without question. That what you're looking for is an experience that you will never forget in a positive way that will be life-changing for you. And the only way I believe you can truly do that for yourself is to do this kind of research. So please spread the net wide, start out with 20 or 30 programs, create a spreadsheet, decide what you want to compare, and then what? Do some genuine comparison shopping. Fill in all of those boxes on that spreadsheet so you have a means of comparing. Lastly, on this point, remember, your perception about the options you're thinking about is what? It's where you end up after you've done your research. It's not where you start out. You don't do a rank order right at the beginning. That's fruitless. That's so ill-advised. You want to do your homework first. Take the time. Do your research. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with what you put on that spreadsheet. Don't sugarcoat it. 
don't try to rank something higher in a particular category just because that school is ranked more highly and you still want to apply. You need to be completely, brutally honest with the information you find out. So remember, it's after you've done this extensive research that you form your list of the five or seven or 10 programs to which you have decided you will apply. I guarantee you, if you do this, your list of schools will change. Nine times out of 10, with the over 850 students I've worked with and even others that I haven't coached one-on-one, -on -one, by doing this, their lists have changed and for the better. Please, please do your research. Now, the importance of planning ahead. Let's say that you are in the process of doing your research, but you're still maybe six, eight months out. That's wonderful. Why? Very quickly. First of all, as we've just been saying, by planning ahead, you allow adequate time for your research. You allow adequate time to do it. If you're rushing and you're two months out from applying, you cannot do the kind of research I just suggested. You've got to take the time. Those of you who are applying this fall to start in the fall of 2024, there's still time. This is April. I would suggest you get started with some heavy duty research as soon as you've heard this lecture. Get started. You've got time. Do it up through July. You still have time. You can, in July and August, if you're going for round one MBA deadlines, that still gives you time to prepare. Please do that research. Second, you will be able to organize your application priorities much more easily if you allow time. Rushing at the end, you've got perhaps a GMAT or GRE score to work on. You've got to get your transcripts. You've got to identify letters of recommendation, finalize your resume, open application accounts, work on essays, all of this. You can't cram that, in my opinion and experience, into a two-month time frame and get it all done along with doing research. You've got to allow time. You need to, that's why, again, you need to be planning way ahead of time. Thirdly, as I just mentioned, you will be able to focus on a standardized test if you need to take one. Many programs are now backing away from the requirements of these tests, but some are still requiring them. And if they are at the schools to which you're applying, then starting ahead. I always, if, in all honesty, if I am coaching students that are, would be, well, I am right now, I'm starting to work with students who will be applying in the fall of 2024 or for the fall of 2024, I encourage them to take their standardized test by May or June, get them out of the way. Then they can focus on the rest of what they're doing leading up to the uh, application deadlines. What's another advantage of planning ahead? Obviously, you can focus much more on essays, recommendation letters. You know, we don't have time to go into all of this now, but your recommendation letters can make or break your application. 90 to 95% of recommendation letters I read as an admissions dean were useless. They were meaningless. They did not help me at all because the recommender clearly didn't do what they were asked to do or they really did not know that applicant very well. So by planning ahead, you've got time to identify the individuals who should best. And by the way, my definition of a good recommender for starters is an individual who knows you long enough and well enough, two, in two ways, knows you long enough and well enough to prepare that letter of recommendation. Another one, less stress and need to be rushing. When you rush, you are under more stress. And lastly, what happens? You make mistakes, avoidable mistakes, not intentional ones, but avoidable mistakes. And that can cost you an application riddled with typographical errors, grammatical errors, things that are very, very out of order, look shabbily put together. You'll be denied immediately, no matter what is in that application. So by planning ahead, way ahead of time, these are the advantages for you. All of them, very, very important. Okay, our time is slipping by. Let's move now to the final part of what I want to share in this lecture. This is a suggested 
12 months application checklist. Now, as I said, if you're planning to apply in September, October, November, December, you don't have a full 12 months. You can adjust some of these. But if you do have more time, here is an ideal 12 month plan or checklist for you. By the way, in my book, I go in, in, in chapter one the, on the research process, I go into far greater detail on this checklist with much more, but this will give you an idea of what is there. So let's go. 12 months out. And by the way, for each of these, for 10 to 12 months out in the book, I go 12 months, 11 months, 10 months. Each month, I give you suggestions. I'm condensing to three month segments here with three suggestions. So obviously, you might expect my first suggestion for 10 to 12 months out would be to start doing your thorough research. Get that spreadsheet going. Create the spreadsheet. You will never regret it. I'm telling you. Get it set up. And again, remember to spread the net wide. As I mentioned earlier, make sure you list your program options in alphabetical order. That helps you not to do any ranking yet. You should not be doing that till the very end, the very end. In fact, if you do it right, some of those institutions you're going to remove before you even finish all of the comparison shopping you're doing because you will all of a sudden realize there's no way I'd want to go there. There's no way. After I've looked at this, 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 and this, they're off the list. So in my opinion, fill in the spreadsheet with your alphabetical options. It will begin to become evident to you how which options are becoming more appealing and how which options are becoming less appealing. All right, seven to nine months out, what do you want to do? Here's some more ways to do some comparison shopping, ladies and gentlemen. Start planning some campus visits or recruiting events. By campus visits, I don't mean if you can go and visit, obviously that's nice, but Many institutions have virtual admissions events. All of them, every one of them has a virtual campus tour. At a minimum, you should take that virtual tour. I had students when I worked at Columbia or University of Chicago had never, ever, ever taken the time simply to review information on our campus. And they would get there and they would be stunned in, in a very negative way sometimes. They would come in to see me and say, I can't stand this campus. It's terrible. And I thought, you mean to tell me as an adult, as a, a college graduate, you didn't even take the time to, if you couldn't visit in person, visit us online? That's ridiculous. So do some campus visits, whether they're in person, online, attend recruiting events. I would think these two items would be on your spreadsheet. What grade do you give that institution for their campus visit? their virtual campus tour, their admissions event that they conducted. Were you more impressed or less impressed after you did these things? Number two, again, start preparing your standardized tests if you have to. Get ready for them. Study if you need to. Do what you need to do. And by the way, here's a side recommendation, which usually I talk more about when I do something about the application process, and that's going to be coming up in a future lecture. But when you take the standardized test, obviously, if you don't get the score you would like or think you can achieve and you want to try again, always take it a second time. But don't keep taking it over and over and over again. We used to have applicants to Chicago Booth who would take their, their test 10 times. The score after three attempts, it's very unlikely that your score is going to change all that much. So please do not do this over and over and over again. Thirdly, this is the point at which I suggest you reach out to current students and recent grads. I don't have to repeat it. It's critically important. I've already said this. I don't need to go much further. Four to six months out, now is the time to sit in on some admissions webinars if they offer them. If they offer an admissions webinar of any kind, maybe just maybe they're going to have some sort of special event where you get to meet faculty members. You get to meet alumni. 
Maybe they will offer an online class, a sample of a class. Anything you can sit in on, any sort of thing with the schools you're thinking about. Is this going to be time consuming? Yes. Will it sometimes doing all this research? Will it sometimes feel like a full-time job? Yes. Will it be to your advantage? Absolutely yes. So sit in on something. This is the time to start confirming recommenders. And what? Meeting with them. Now, are you going to write your letters? Absolutely not. That is something you don't want to go that far. I often work with recommenders in my coaching work with my clients. I actually help them prepare their letters. But the point is, you want to meet with them and give them a little bit of coaching on how best they can help you in this process. Outstanding letters of recommendation will move you up in terms of positive, positively being noticed. Without a doubt, they will every time because so many of them are bad. So if you have good ones, that's going to help you tremendously. So again, you, won't, well, you don't want to ask them two weeks beforehand, oh, will you do this for me? No, 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 no. You want them confirmed well in advance of when you submit that application. And lastly, for this period of time, finalize your resume, make sure it's completely as it should be, and get a copy of your transcripts. Make sure you've got them ready to go, okay? Three to One to three months out. This is now coming down to crunch time, so to speak. This is when you open up your application accounts, get them opened, get them set up so you've got that going. And then in my suggestion, fill in the, all of that busy work is what I call it. The demographic information, your name, your address, your, your military service, all of, this, all of this information that they're asking. Unfortunately, there is not one particular place you can go to fill that in just once and then it populates all your applications. You have to do this right now individually. It's time consuming, but it's it's a no brainer. So get it out of the way and then upload your resume, your transcripts, your letter of record, get that all done. Why? Then with all that out of the way, what does that leave time for? That leaves quality and quantity time for you to spend on one of the most critical elements of your application, which obviously is the preparation of your essays. Most grad schools, most MBA schools do not do interviews of all applicants anymore. I'm very disheartened about that, but that's the reality. They don't. So your essays are the opportunity for you to come off the page, so to speak. So as you prepare those essays, with all of the other information on your application already completed, you can spend time focusing on them. And then, obviously, you're ready to submit that application on time and feel as though you spent time planning ahead, doing your research, getting ready, so that you're submitting excellent applications. I'm telling you, at least 30% of applications, or maybe as much as 40%, are denied not because that applicant was not qualified, but because their application was not well prepared. That immediately sends up red flags to the admissions committee. So you must be sure you're allowing time to help you have a better idea of where you most would feel comfortable attending and then preparing the best applications you can. All right, that was an awful lot to give you in a short space of time. Let me quickly close by mentioning my book, Roadmap for Graduate Study. This book applies to any particular field of study, including the MBA, including other master's programs, PhD. If you go on my website, click on the book section and you decide to order it, you can click on the promo code GSRM. And if so, you'll receive the book for 50% off. So I, four chapters, first chapter, all about what we talked about today, the research process. Second chapter, about the application process. Third chapter, I've never seen a book out there for prospective graduate students that includes this. And that is how to succeed once you're there. How to make the most of your graduate school experience. Fourth and final chapter, four lists of 10 questions each for prospective students, applicants, 
admitted students, and current students. The top 10 questions each of those four groups have asked me over the years and my response to them. I hope you'll check out the book. Lastly, Coaching with Grad School Roadmap. Uh, I do offer this service. As I mentioned, it does not cost thousands of dollars. It is one-on-one. -on -one. If you sign up to work with me, you will work exclusively with me from whatever point we start until whatever point we conclude. We've got a phenomenal acceptance rate with quite a bit of funding that has been awarded to our students. And perhaps most interesting to you might be to that we offer a free 30-minute consultation. How do you do that? At the bottom of this slide, you can complete the contact form on our web page and or you can reach out to me. My email address is right there at the top of the screen, dmartin at gradschoolroadmap.com. I welcome your outreach at any point, and uh, I wish you so much success now as you continue to embark on this added journey of uh, completing your MBA applications. I wish you every continued success. Thank you so much for taking this time with me. And remember, I'm going to close with the way I started out. You can do this. It is absolutely possible. My best wishes to all of you. Nellie, thanks again to you and your colleagues for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Have a great day, everybody.